Right, I've started recording. Uh, well, welcome everybody to the uh, Cleveland Institution of Engineers lunchtime panel discussion. Uh, this is the first time we've had a lunchtime event like this, so uh, it'll be interesting to see how it goes. Um, I'll just briefly share my screen uh, to show you the uh, next month's event. Can you all see that now? It's a poster for uh, a lecture on the Woodsmith Polyhalite mine, which is the new mine near Whitby. Um, uh, and it'll be given by uh, Matt Parsons from Anglo-American, and they'll be talking about the progress with the mine uh, and what the uh, future plans are for it. There'll be more details on that circling on the newsletter. Uh, anybody who's not on our mailing list, if you would like to join, please send me an email uh, and I can add you. Right, so I think without further ado, uh, I'll hand over to David Hughes uh, and let him uh, introduce the panel and uh, progress the events. Over to you. Uh, by the way, could everybody else who is not having a speaking role please mute their microphones via the uh, button at the bottom, uh, and I will do the same. Thank you. Over to you, David. Brilliant. Thanks very much. So, yeah, well, thanks, everybody, for joining. Really uh, great to have so many of you here, and it's a real privilege to uh, be here with you today. We're going to start with some introductions, get uh, you to know the panel, get to know who's here, and uh, then we'll get into some interesting technical discussion. That I, I think, you know, Two things actually I'm really excited about from this afternoon, not just the, the incredible opportunity that non-mechanical recycling presents to us, but also the, the regional opportunity that is opening up increasingly. So I'll start by introducing myself. My name's uh, Dr. David Hughes. I'm an associate professor here at Teesside University, um, but I'm also the chair of the IOM3 uh, Polymer Society or Polymer Group uh, nationally. And that's you know, a great platform. Those of you who are working in the polymer sector it's a great network to be involved in for these sort of things. And for those of you who are joining from the Polymer Society, I can see some of you in the chat, then uh, you know, really glad that you've been able to join this regional event today, as well as we, uh, we co-work between the CIE, a regional uh, part of the IOM3, and the IOM3 Polymer Group. So that's me. We're going to go around now and get to, to meet the other panelists and understand a little bit about them. So I'm going to come to, to John Twitchin of Stuff for Life first and ask John you just to give us a really quick overview of, of you, your company, and the, the key issue that you, you and your business are trying to address. Thanks, David. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so quick overview. I, I'm John, uh, my business partner, Miles, and I were both at university together uh, a million years ago, not quite a million years ago, maybe half a million years ago. And, um, uh, and we've, we've, you know, we, we've had careers in, in sort of various different uh, sectors, but in an environmental science role. So Miles was heading up environment quality and safety at aggregate industries for a number of years. Uh, and my my background is in the resource management sector. Um, again, for, for best part of a quarter of a century, um, and we are looking at things like high vis uh, jackets and and so on. Thinking, well, what, what happens to them at the end of their life? And it turns out they go in a hole or up a chimney. So what we're really um, what we're doing uh, with with David, actually with Teesside University is is creating a solution to that and it's chemical recycling and trying to keep it as simple as possible uh, i'm not the chemist in the room i'm sure there's plenty um but it's not me um but um yeah we're, we're that's what we're doing so we're you know really looking at difficult materials difficult polymers not necessarily more complex than sort of hazardous if you like more com complicated uh, and where there's no epr or no real kind of um, produce responsibility um, program at the moment um, and really trying to make sure that um, motivated organisations are, you know, in a really good place for, for those conversations they're going to be having to have over the next few years. Uh, and as I say, we started with polyester, it's really good timing. Uh, we're looking at some other materials as well. Um, and obviously, I think another key theme for us is, is onshoring or reshoring uh, some of the technology, some of the processing, the capabilities that we have, the skills that we have in the UK and actually, you know, using them, adapting them, retraining them and so on, refocusing them. So that's kind of, that's it. I think that's probably less than two minutes, but um, that's it and us. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, that's excellent. So, well, 
Laura, we'll come come to you. Same question, really. Quick overview and, and, and the challenge you're addressing. Yeah, so I'm Laura Hepburn. I'm the director and founder of Greenology Teesside. And we are very similar to the other people on the call. I'm so pleased to be invited to be on uh, to start with, to be having this conversation. Um, but we are taking, again, problems and let's say tires, wind turbine blades that people aren't taking responsibility for, so legacy waste, and creating solutions. And not only that, we are creating valuable byproducts so that it's a very good business model. So encouraging people to be sustainable, responsible with their goods, and traceable. So if we do things very differently. For example, we'll take a tire and we can trace it from source and then all the way through to biofuel at the end and encouraging our customers to be part of that journey so they can see what carbon they've saved as well with it being zero emissions. But we're very keen on making sure that what we do, we do now. We think that 2030 is too long and you know 2050 is too late. We're trying to get to that just transition, but also working very closely in partnership with other people to look at where the future lies. So that is um, creating hydrogen from the process, from our depolymerization, and you know, using other materials in conjunction and collaboration with people on this call right now to be able to make it sustainable. And that's where we're heading. So I think that's a quick overview of what we're doing. Yeah, that's really exciting. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, Andrew, I'm going to come to you next. Right, unmuting would help. Uh, yes, I'm Andrew Gooder. I'm working with a company called Warn Again. It's a small startup chemical company based in Nottingham. Um, we've been running a pilot plant uh, with CPI up at Wilton on Teesside. Uh, Warn again are developing a, a chemical recycling process for mixed textiles. So one of the big challenges with textile recycling is that we tend to mix them all up. Uh, the two which are most widely used are polyester and cotton. Uh, and so the Warn again process is a way to chemically uh, separate, uh, purify, recycle, uh, ready for reuse, both the polyester and the cellulose from the cotton. Uh, it's an exciting technology with it with a huge potential. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. Thanks very much. And Dan, coming to you finally. Yeah, hi, my name is Dan Meller. I'm the uh, operations manager for Renew ELP. Uh, Renew ELP are like all, I guess, all the other uh, panelists stop startup company, part of uh, Mura Technology Group. Um, who have a process called the Hydro PRS system, um, which um, is predominantly targeting um, post-consumer end-of-life plastics. So those plastics that have been through mechanical um, recycling um, and end up in, in, in landfill or incineration, um, our process takes those, those plastics um, uses supercritical steam and, and turns those back into hydrocarbon liquids, which can then go back into refining, steam cracking, um, and, and go back into making virgin grade uh, polymers. Brilliant. I mean, I'm sure everybody else on the call will think the same as me. What just really exciting panel today, and you know, different technologies, lo lots to be interested in, lots to be excited about actually actually i think in terms of you know the technological solutions we're looking at today and what we've asked the, the panel to do really is to sort of in, introduce us to the core technology um why it's a good solution uh, for the defined problem and you know some of the output products they're looking at many of them have alluded to that already but uh, you know looking to have a bit of a technical discussion today and after that we'll, we'll have some free discussion um and then uh, in, invite some questions from the floor so we're going to go in the same uh, order. So I'm going to come to John first, just giving him a heads up, um, really just asking the panelists a little bit more detail on the technical nature of the process. So John, over to you. Thanks very much. I'm going to try and share one slide um, just to talk to. Um, let me try that now. So can you see my screen? Yeah, we can. That looks great. Okay, great. Yeah. So this is this is the process, basically. 
Um, well, anyone can draw a wheel. That's our first point. Um, but, but, you know, actually making it, making it work and making it make sense is, is quite another matter, isn't it? I'm sure there's a lot of people with experience of that. Um, so, um, very briefly, you know, sort of three quarters of the, of the pie, if you like, uh, uh, you know, are in place already. Things are made, they're supplied in, they're used and they're, um, well, they're not returned actually. They're just put in a bin at the moment. Um, the, a lot of the materials that all of us on the call actually are, in, are involved with or the, from the technology side. Um, and, and that's where the, that's where the fun starts really. And I think, you know, this isn't just about, and it is, you know, it is. Uh, there is a focus on this, but it isn't just about the recycling. It's also about challenging why why it's been thrown away. You know, the purpose, um, uh, longevity, which obviously is going to massively help with um, the impact of the product in the first place. There's a whole servitization piece around it as well. Of you know, do you need to buy something? Could it, you know, is there a service that can be delivered rather than a product? Um, and, and ultimately, that 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 then you know pushes back up the system, if you like, in terms of reuse and redesign um, and really understanding. And I'm sure, you know, I know, um, Warren, again, you, you guys are looking at this a lot and and, and others, but, you, you know, that, that whole kind of what's the purpose? Why is it here? Why is it why has it been thrown away? Uh, and, and and then it's about, you know, recycling that material, simplifying it, um, you know, removing some of the complexity. Um, then zooming in, I know, David, you want to you want to get into some of the tech and I might lean on you anyway, but, um, but in terms then of, of the actual process, we've been looking at, at, at different processes for different polymers and, and difficult materials that we're uh, challenging materials that we're focused on. But just thinking about polyester fabric um, textiles for a minute, um, you know, we've looked at, at different options um, and I've been involved as well, you know, from a sort of a, a different perspective, working with Preska, who are a sportswear manufacturer, um, you know, looking at, at, at options with them and kind of some of that thinking and, and learning has come into this project and, and what we're doing now is Stuff for Life with Teesside Uni. Um, but we've really honed in on, on hydrolysis, um, primarily because, you know, it's relatively simple. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's fairly, you know, non-aggressive in, in many ways. It's relatively uncomplicated and, and as I say, straightforward. Um, and I think that's quite important, especially as we go through a learning um, process and a learning phase, but also with some of the things that we're looking to recover, um, whether it's pigments or the glass beads that make up the high vis, because we're really focused on that work by piece at the moment, um, and primarily and principally on polyester. And obviously, there's some polycotton in there as well, and and really really extracting, ultimately extracting that precursor, that that monomer, um, in in this case, terephthalic acids. Um, there's some purification steps and processes that we're inevitably going to need to go through um, uh, in order to be able to feed it back into into the system that exists already. So one of our principal kind of drivers, if you like, is working with existing infrastructure, whether that's collect and shred uh, and that whole process, um, or obviously as well at, at, at the other end, feeding that that product, if you like, back in um to to the process now one of the challenges i think we're all facing in terms of of textiles and, and some other materials as well or, or product um sectors as well is there's not actually a lot of manufacturing in the uk um so that's probably the the, the really big the really big challenge um but it's not to say that 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 polyester or the monomer isn't being used and utilized and and, and turned into things in the uk so i think you know, that's a, a relatively sort of high level and brief overview. We've gone from, I think it's fair to say, David, from very much desktop of a lab to now, you know, relatively serious bit of upscale um, kit. So we've gone from, I suppose, milliliters to, to liters, um, which is a fairly, fairly big step. Um, and we're, we're really live with that now, um, you know, working with workwear manufacturers and suppliers um, who are, who have this challenge you know, in front of them. And obviously there's an EPR discussion that sort of started and about to kick off in, in a grander scar, uh, style next year. Um, so yeah, do you want any more than that, David, at this stage, or is that an okay overview? No, that's absolutely fine. And I think John, one of the things I, I like about the slide you've shown and, and the business that you've got is it's not just recycling, but actually you're involved in that whole circular business model, the supply, the reuse, the, you know, and I, I think that's quite useful for people on the call to see, particularly those who, 
you know, still understanding the challenge here, obviously the, the, the pinnacle of this isn't just recycling. We, you know, all of us on this, this panel would say the same, you know, recycling is what you do when something is end of life, but, you know, extending its end of, you know, its end of life point, getting the most value from a material is both energy wise and financially the, the best thing to do. And I, I like that wheel, John, that you're showing there that, that shows that, that wanting to keep the value in the process. I think that's really helpful. So thanks for sharing that. That's really helpful. Brilliant. Okay. Well, let's keep going around. Laura, we're going to come to you next um, for, a, for a similar overview, if that's okay. Yeah, I feel like it, it's one of them calls, isn't it, where somebody steals your thunder and you think, I was going to say that. <laughs> um, so cheers for that. Um, obviously, we deal with pyrolysis. Um, we came into the industry, I came into the industry 10 years ago, and, we, and there's a question in today about why are you in Teesside? I did my master's in future design 10 years ago at Teesside Uni. And it enabled me to look at, well, in the early days before people even talked about it, what we were doing with plastics and what could we do with plastics in third world countries to make a difference. And it was really, really uh, quite eye opening back then that there wasn't some, you know, great solution to this. It was a massive problem. So we were looking at really innovative solutions and you know how could it help other communities to create funds uh, jobs empower people it was a lot more than just recycling uh, there was a lot of people that were doing eco bricks and for anybody that's probably hearing that word that's been in the industry is probably shuddering because it's mixing several plastics at once which we all hate um so i started to look into the mod and what they were using and at the time they were going through pyrolysis and they had on their aircraft carriers um, they've had it for the last 19 years, uh, some really small scale units and it was, it was working efficiently and it, and it actually kind of grabbed my, I, I guess, the need to do something for change and I looked at it and I was trying to look at biomass as well at the time and I just didn't feel that biomass was sustainable, whereas depolymerization, obviously pyrolysis has been around for years. It's been thousands of years, but it's predominantly been a very dirty industry, as is waste, let's be honest, you know. And I kind of thought, well, is there a, a different way of looking at this? Is there a different way of doing this? And so I've spent the last two years trying to get away from the dirty industry that it was, uh, the waste industry, and especially plastics. My eyes were massively opened to how we were dealing with it. And John said about incineration and landfill. And it, it just didn't seem like anybody was actually taking a handle on this and kind of going, shh, shh, it's okay. We can just keep burning it or we can just keep burying it and it'll be all okay. So I looked into the pyrolysis depolymerization side of it, different types of technology from all over the world. And my key was to look at why it was failing. Why was it going wrong? Was it because it was too big? was it was it was too small and and it wasn't commercialized and i come from a commercial background so i was looking at the figures and it was the figures of the throughput that was driving the generation of the product and so i've worked very closely with different people who are world leading from around the world to start asking questions and a bit of scrutiny of why and then focusing on the reasons it was failing, the emissions, the dirtiness, the fuel stock, the supply, and me being the way I am, wanted to do it differently. So looked at the plastics, decided there was other things that people could do that are probably on this call right now that were much better in the plastics industry. And I am really interested in legacy waste. So for me, it was the tire industry. And there are like 17 million tires that literally are wasted every year, let alone the legacy waste that we are faced with right now. And they're the biggest contributor to microplastics. So I decided to focus on that, but I did it differently. I did it as a commercial business, not just as engineering. So I worked on the engineering side to make sure that it was zero emissions, that the gas that we created could go back into the system to fuel the system that we created valuable byproducts at the end that were sellable and commercialized, but also that we got 
feedstock in that was sustainable and responsible. So for example, we work with the likes of JCB and Pirelli and again, saying the same as John, making sure that it was a full closed circle solution. So we could take in the tires and then we currently shred them down into small bite size, few, few props here. And then they go through the granulator which has been delivered that was stuck in the Suez Canal for God knows how many weeks. So it's here and it's granulating, woohoo. And then the granulator obviously can be sold on into, the product can be then sold into 3G pitches. We're doing work with tarmac at the moment to look at roads. So again, full circle usage, the fluff, the steel, everything is used. And then 50% of that then goes into pyrolysis which then strips it back to its natural source without getting too techy and is heated up. Everything's reused in the system. It's carbon negative. And then the solution that we've got can then create either hydrogen, energy, cooling, chilling, heating. And the big thing for us is biofuel. So we are working with Greenergy at the moment and they are buying our fuel for the next five years because we want to be able to give an alternative for the transition because we know EVs and hydrogen aren't going to be ready by then, but we know that biofuel is an alternative that we could be using in the meantime for that transition. So that's where we're kind of at, but we're also, again, looking ahead of the wave and we're working on the same bit of technology can also create hydrogen. So we're working on turquoise hydrogen, blue hydrogen, green hydrogen. We can apply this technology to that using methane to create hydrogen. So there's lots of different avenues that we're looking at, but it's looking at those problems and the legacy that we are faced with right now. Um, but encouraging our customers to be sustainable, responsible, and not just greenwash by saying, here's a ticket box, we're doing it, but be able to say what they're getting from the system. How are they using that back in their tires? How are they using that fuel to create energy for their generators? So that's a quick overview of what we're doing here. Well, that's brilliant. Really, really interesting. And I, I love that narrative that's just continuing. And I think it's so important for people to understand is that, you know, these kind of recycling businesses do so much more than just process waste and throw it out the back door that there's you know a huge environmental drive for everyone you're going to meet on today's panel and you know despite some uh, perceptions around the waste industry as a whole the non-mechanical waste industry is driven by people who want to make a shift and i just think that's you know great example laura we'll, we'll come back to some of that um some of those points later on particularly the zero emissions i just think that's you know a brilliant point in the process to be able to, to say. Okay, well, let's keep going around though. Well, Andrew, we're going to come to you and warn again and understand a bit more about your process. Okay, I'm just going to try and share slides. That's great. Yep, yeah, we can see that now. Okay, should be maximize so just yeah, let's run great. through this quickly so our purpose is to replace virgin polycotton with circular polycotton so recycling the polyester and the cotton as i was saying um, today's textile recycling doesn't work um, in these cases because current mechanical recycling methods are unable to separate dyes and other contaminants um, so it's only really applicable in very uh, you know, limited number of cases, uh, and also unable to separate blended polyester and cotton, which is, you know, a huge proportion of uh, the textiles that are produced. So solvent-based recycling, um, rationally identified selected solvents to dissolve specific polymers from the matrix and extract them into a liquid phase. So um, it's sometimes classed with chemical recycling, but it's different. You know, we are you know, not depolymerizing and repolymerizing. We're keeping the polymers as polymers, you know, doing as little damage to them as possible to you know, minimize the energy and the impact uh, from doing that. So the extracted polymers can be highly purified and returned to you know, a near virgin quality uh, in, a, in a number of steps um, and you know, minimizing 
the damage. Uh, it's more complicated, obviously, the mechanical recycling, but you know we're able to accept you know a much wider range of feedstocks um, and give uh, a really big value uplift compared to just throwing it in a hole in the ground or burning it, which are really the only alternatives at the moment. So we've been working on validating that process. Um, we developed a conceptual process uh, with specially selected solvents, painted those uh, developed in the lab and now working at pilot scale. Um, we dissolve the materials, we filter out insoluble contaminants. The solvents are all evaporated and recycled. So, you know, absolutely minimizing any, any solvent loss. They all stays inside the process. The PET is extruded, uh, ready to be reused as a replacement for virgin PET. And the cellulose from the cotton is precipitated for reuse to replace virgin wood cellulose, which is used to make fibers like tensile and viscose. So it's going back into those replacements for cotton. Cotton is itself, you know, quite a problematic crop, uh, uses lots of water, lots of pesticides, and, and has quite a big environmental burden itself. So this is what the, the worn again sort of ecosystem looks like. So this is sort of our equivalent of the of the first slide. Uh, looks a bit similar. Um, so you know we fit into um, you know a, a system. We're very much working with you know the supply chain for people who are collecting um, the used textiles, processing those, maximizing the amount of uh, textiles that can be reused as textiles because obviously that's you know by far the best thing to do but then those things which are not suitable for um for reuse and rewear um those then are going to be automatically uh, sorted by fiber composition they're going to be clipped and stripped to remove zips and buttons and things which can be a problem in the process um then they go through a, a pre-processing pre-treatment cleaning process and then into the heart of the worn again process where the uh, the polyester is um, is dissolved um, and purified so we we remove non-polyester polymers and dyes and other impurities first and then we dissolve the pure polyester and remove the the solvent to just leave the polyester behind um, that we can extrude into uh, pellets those pellets can go then to the normal companies who you know, buy virgin pellets and turn it back into fibers. Um, and similarly with the cellulose, the cellulose is, uh, is dissolved uh, and filtered and purified, uh, then re-precipitated from our special mix of solvents. Uh, and that can then you know, replace dissolving wood pulp going through a lyocell process or a viscose process to again be turn back into fiber to be spun into textiles to go back into polycotton or or whatever so you know this is very much part of you know going a long way it's not going to be the whole solution but it's going a long way towards being able to close the loop on textile recycling for a lot of textiles for which there's there's no solution at the moment and we have a lot of support from you know brands and retailers for textiles one of the early investors in Warren again was a company called h and M. I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, but many others as well have got a strong interest in finding a way of doing this. I mean, the companies are are really desperate. There is a huge demand out in the marketplace for recycled materials, you know, genuine recycled materials. And in fact, there's a big commercial opportunity because the demand is so high that actually, in many cases, recycled materials are more valuable than virgin materials. So, you know, this all makes economic sense as well as environmental sense. Okay. Brilliant. Again, you know, just another hugely helpful diagram, I think, for us all there, Andrew. Really appreciate that. And again, I just really want to underline again that, again, this isn't a business just trying to throw as much stuff through its magic process. It's, you know, wherever possible, we're trying to send things to reuse and earlier uh, stages in terms of that waste hierarchy and only processing what needs to be processed again I just think that's you know, you know really important and you know really helpful for you to show that in the diagram so thanks for that Andrew perfect okay well Dan finally coming to you and renew LP then yep no problem I'll again I'll uh, got some slides to to Excellent. share yeah thanks very much um, let me know when you can see those yeah we'll do
Yeah, I can see that coming up now. Great. Yeah, and full screen. Perfect. Okay, so I won't go through the first few slides. Um, I, I won't go through in any great detail. I think most people have seen um, a lot of these numbers, uh, various uh, documentaries and, and, and press releases, but they, they clearly show, you know, there's a large demand for plastic um, out there. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of that plastic ends up um, in landfill or, or as energy um, uh, from waste. One thing I, uh, in my introduction, I, I, we talked about um, you know plastic plastic waste and plastic ended in landfill. But one of the other challenges we see at uh, Renew is the CO two challenge. So um, you know production of plastic is is, is energy intensive, um, and and as we see demand for for plastic continuing to increase, that is only going to get uh, you know that CO two emissions are only going to get larger. Um, and where we see the, the hydro PRS technology helping in this is more around the emissions from incineration. So from a, a fossil fuel you know, uh, point, of, point of view, coal is, is seen as, 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 the, uh, as the worst of the lot. If we, um, but if you compare that to coal to energy from waste, um, burning of plastic is, is over 1.5 times, it emits 1.5 times more CO2. Uh, than than coal. So if we can if we can prevent that plastic from getting into that you know that energy from waste stream, um, we can reduce that. Uh, we can have an impact on reducing the the global CO two emissions. Um, and where we see the opportunity in doing that is 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 displacement of that that feedstock into the petrochemical and and, and, and plastic industry, moving that away from fossil based to recycled feedstock. Um, I think as the points down on the left there, as much as, you know, there's a, in some quarters, there's a drive to remove plastic altogether. That, that, that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen for a number of reasons. You know, plastic is a very useful material. Um, and, and quite often the alternatives aren't necessarily uh, the right answer to, to the problem. So, okay, removing glass, uh, replacing plastic bottles uh, with glass, might have an impact with regards to the plastic we see in the oceans or in landfill. Um, but if you start to look at the CO2 emissions, it, it, it's not the right answer. So I think you know, with Renew, we still see plastic having a large um, part to play. Um, and so what we need to do is look at how we can make uh, plastic in a more um, sustainable um, uh, and, and that circular economy in that circular economy. Uh, so our intention is to, to is to displace uh, feedstocks into steam crackers and refineries, replace that from a fossil source to a to a recycled product. So the way we do that is we have a a, a solution that's called Hydro PRS. Um, it is uh, classed as a or still classed as a pyrolysis type process, but we we sort of see it as a hydrothermal um, recycling system, and it uses supercritical water. Um, to to um, break down the the polymer molecules um, and taking them back into their sort of original feedstock constituents, so such as, as such as naphtha. So in terms of hydro PRS, um, it can cover a large scope of plastic types. Um, we're particularly looking at the, those ones that are currently hard to recycle or cannot be recycled by, you know, the more traditional mechanical mean so so flexibles multi-layered films you know food packaging um, crisp packets um and that, that that those kind of plastics coming from mixed and post-consumer um uh, waste it can also take contaminated materials so you know particularly around uh, uh, food contamination uh, they can go into the process um and and, and um, they don't have a detrimental effect um, and we very much see hydro PRS as being, and, and, and chemical recycling as a whole, as an industry as a whole, it's complementary to mechanical recycling. Um, it, you know, it's it's all these recycling types or, or, or mechanisms, they all have their role to play in, in solving this, this um, problem we have with, with plastics. So where we see hydro PRS coming in is that, that end of life, where those plastics... Uh, where it's beneficial and, and, and 
you know, in the bigger picture, it's better for those plastics to be mechanical, mechanically recycled, let them go through that mechanical process. But once, you know, as we know, mechanical processes over time um, are detrimental to the, the qualities that we, we want out of the plastic. So, so once they've been through to a point where they can no longer be mechanically recycled, um, the hydro PRS system will take those um, and convert them back into hydrocarbon liquids. Um, as you said, we, what we do is we, we mix the, the plastic. I've got a block flow diagram, which we'll go through in, in a minute, but we mix the plastics with supercritical water. And the advantage of the, uh, the supercritical water is it allows us to, to build these plants at scale um, because you've got a more homogeneous uh, heat transfer and mixing, um, which makes it, it much more efficient. Um, because you can get this homogeneous and, and rapid heating, it avoids um, excessive temperatures and uh, you know in areas of the process or plastic, which can lead to char formation. Um, so all our you know all our products that come out um, are, are usable and, and recyclable. Um, we have high conversions. The, the steam allows us to have high conversions because it, it, it one it acts as a as a, an organic solvent. But it also provides a, a source of hydrogen. So when you've got free radicals whizzing around inside the inside the process, the water will donate uh, the hydrogen to 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 um, um, stabilize that free radical, and that prevents those from from forming you know the the unwanted kind of products, the chars, the coke. Um, so it suppresses the reactions um, to, to the ones that we want. Um, and, and this closes the loop. So it, 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 there's no, at the moment, there's no anticipated limits to the number of times we can put plastic through this process. It can go round and round and round. Um, so it, in terms of the, the process, um, we, we take the plastic and that, that's cleaned, it's shredded and cleaned. We remove contaminants such as um, grit, stone, glass, metals, um, anything that might have a detrimental uh, effect on the on the downstream equipment that then goes through um, an extruder where it's it's taken up to, to pressure and melted and then mixed with the, the supercritical steam we then give it some further heat uh, to get it up to its reaction conditions um, and as it enters the uh, that the hydro prs reactor um, where the the plastics are converted into into liquid um, we then let that down. So, so the hydro PRS reactors operate at quite high pressure, around 280 bar. Uh, we then let that down um, and flash that into a, a distillation column where we can separate out the, the products into, into the various um, constituents that we want. Um, again, the, the target feedstocks is very much those end of life post-consumer plastics. Um, we can take the process will take any type of feedstock although we are focusing on those sort of hard to 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 currently recycle um end of life plastics so the products that we'll get out of the uh, the process is we get uh, four four liquids um the four main products um naphtha uh, distillate gas oil heavy gas oil uh, all of those will go back into um, the petrochemical and refining industries um, and go back into making uh, uh, plastics, chemicals um, and oils. Um, and then we, we also get a heavy wax residue, which will which will go into to blending bitumen um, into sort of road infrastructure um, or going into heavy refining processes. We also get a, a process gas stream that comes off from the reactors, um, and that's that's typically made up of some of the other contaminants that you would get, and it's why why we can take uh, contaminated um, um, plastics, so things like food, paper, they they get converted into a, a process gas, which we then feed back round and use that to to uh, fire the boilers that make the the supercritical steam. So just just some in terms of the key process advantages, it, it's scalable. You know what, what we're facing is is a big problem with regards to plastic, um, as the numbers in the first first slide show. Um, there's a lot to there's a lot for us to 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 try and tackle. 
So we believe this is scalable on, on Wilton. We're currently uh, building one of these plants with a capacity of 20 kilotons per year of plastic, which, we look, which we're looking to expand that to 80 with an additional three lines. But we're also looking at, you know, scaling these up into, can we make these into 50 unit, uh, 50 kiloton uh, units or 100 kiloton units? Um, and because of that, 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 that supercritical steam and, and homogeneous mixing, um, that, that's achievable. achievable. It's, uh, it has the ability to, to recycle all types of major plastics, um, including those, those difficult, those, those ones that are currently difficult to recycle. Uh, and because of that, that, that super critical steam, um, we have um, more controllability or high controllability of the reaction conditions, uh, which means that we can stabilize the, the products um, and get them to, to uh, meet um, the offtake uh, requirements. Uh, we don't get char or any unwanted byproducts, um, um, which again, which is a, a further advantage. Okay, so this is just a, a layout of, of, of what the, uh, the Wilton International Project will look like. Um, the, the big building um, is where we, we, we bring in the plastic, shred it and, and, and take out the contaminants. And then the hydrothermal reactors are in that, that small structure um, along with the, the, the distillation column. Um, and then, and then the various um, storage vessels, and then there's a number of utility units that, that go with that. Okay, uh, so in terms of life cycle assessments, uh, um, we are currently going through, um, working through a number of, of life cycle assessments, um, and, and early signs are positive. So in terms of global warming potential, um, you know, we're divert, diverting waste away from, uh, from energy. Um, so reducing that CO2 impact. Um, if we compare the uh, hydrocarbon production, um, sorry, the, the production of the hydrocarbon liquids via the hydro PRS versus uh, producing them via, via fossil. Again, we're, we're seeing advantages in that. Um, and it supports the ambition of a viable pathway to net zero. So, so these kind of processes um, can, be, you know, like all like all the other uh, sort of chemical processes, we can look at carbon capture, uh, the use of hydrogen um, to get to to net zero. Okay. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, again, just you know, really exciting project. Really pleased that it's uh, happening here in Teesside. I think you know. Uh, uh, brilliant technology, you know, for different technologies, but for, you know, really complementary things. Um, I want to start giving people, you know, delegates the opportunity to ask some questions via the chat function. So if you want to start typing those in, we're going to have a little bit of a discussion now. But if you want to start dropping some questions in for the panel, please, you know, write those into the chat function uh, and uh, we'll give as many of those to the panel as we can. But Laura, actually, I wanted to come to you first, if that's OK, just as we start to talk around this and you know, everybody else on the panel, feel free to just start chipping in. Um, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, really just wanted to understand. Um, what's the what's the word I'm looking for? The word traceable. You use this word traceable about the fact you can trace the tires coming in, going out. I know that the waste in and materials out is actually a, a pretty significant challenge for all the businesses here. So I just wondered if you could say something about how you're approaching that traceability, because I think that's really interesting. Laura? No? Okay. Oh, yes, yes, she's unmuted. Um, so ah, we're currently right. uh, working with Teesside University, um, nice plug, um, to look at the traceability because in the sector, we know, I've, I've been there, I've worked in the plastic sector for a long time and there is a lot of dumped waste. And, and, it, and it was waste crime. And, you know, I, I've done a lot of clear ups in my time to see that we needed to start actually being able to monitor um, the life cycle of these. And I'm going to use tires. I won't go back to plastics, but mm. definitely with tires from source to the end product. 
because we need to look at you know how much carbon are we saving by putting through this process and within our process we are actually creating carbon capture mm -hmm. with what we do and yeah. so we want to be able to we're working on a little app and a system at the moment okay nice so uh that we can monitor how much we are saving on the journey so we mm. take the tires at source a lot of other competitors probably buy that product in and we are doing it all on site we're the first one to actually have a full circle from tire to oil in one pass because commercially it just made more and more sense as well and um so yeah we can then relay that to our customers so if they want to track a tire or if they want to see when it was shredded or did it go into a playground or you know they can see the life cycle that it's gone into three generators or it's gone into uh, another set of tires for pirelli they are not only saving carbon capturing carbon it's becoming a carbon negative process not just neutral not just mm -hmm. no emissions there's a lot more to it but then that links in with the responsibility angle as well that people want to know what they're saving and whether it is a greenwashing exercise or esg or whatever it is we're encouraging people and educating people about the difference they're making by putting it through this process mm -hmm. so there's lots of benefits to this but we think that the trade in the sector is the only way to clean up the sector uh it's very important that mm. we do that yeah no that's excellent great well we've got some questions starting to come into the chat as well and i think that's really important laura because you know i think the the in the inputs and the you know the traceability of this is really important actually i want to ask a question and you know someone's uh, um just just posted the same thing really dan i'm going to come to you on this which is to do with the light well you just talked about it just a minute ago so on the life cycle assessment that you've been doing obviously the you know me report um uh, a couple of years ago uh, didn't paint the best picture of chemical recycling called for more um you know information more traceability like laura's just been uh, speaking about um obviously i know you're going through a really rigorous um in fact very 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 rigorous uh, life cycle assessment at the moment could you just maybe talk a little bit about exactly you know how that's going and, and you know the, the degree that you're having to go through in that process yeah i mean so as you said i mean from a per personally from from a personal point of view i've not been massively involved in in in, in the life cycle assessments but you know as you said with the chemical industry yeah, the chemical recycling industry coming in it, it's new it's um i think it's fair to say it's you know some of the other re re recycling um groups probably see it as a threat um, although we as a chemical uh, recycling uh, community uh, don't you know we're very much there to complement uh, the whole the whole um recycling uh, community um so that you know there are a lot of questions being asked about this in terms of you know what's what's its environment environmental impact um so we, we've been working with the the university of warwick quite closely um in terms of looking at the the life cycle assessments um and and as, as you said in the, the slides there you know they are looking um to to make um they are looking favorable i guess the the, the challenge that we have or one of the challenges that we have is what do we compare them to mm. because there aren't similar well, as far as i'm aware there are not many or similar life cycle assessments for other types of recycling um so i think ultimately to to see you know see that advantage we're going to have to have something uh, to compare them to mm. and so maybe to the other panelists as well how do you talk about your processes comparison to traditional recycling obviously it does something that traditional recycling can't do but how do you cross that bridge of the inherent need for energy use and the displacement of you know natural uh, well, of original feedstock and things like that does anyone have a particular mechanism that you use to to communicate that because i think that's a key challenge for the whole sector if anyone's got the magic answer then i'm in if i can just come in on that david mm. i think yeah i'd like to add a, another dimension as well i mean we're very early stage at the moment and still learning a lot about that process but that traceability of in in and out at sort of you know a, a number of atoms kind of level that mass balance piece is obviously critical and making sure that things aren't double counted intentionally or otherwise uh or you know 
wrongly or otherwise, um, you know, is really, really important. The rigorous process that Dan's been talking about mm. and Laura's been talking about. And what I'd like to add, though, is that in terms of the cost, one of the questions was about, you know, the, the, the economics and the environmental will follow. Um, what I would say on that is what we are not in, you know, as a, as a society at the moment doing is actually accounting for the environmental cost uh, or the social cost as well. And, you know, um, uh, Andrew alluded to some of the impacts of, um, you know, for example, cotton. Um, and this isn't to say, you know, one's better than the other or one's worse than the other. It's just to say that everything has an impact. And some of those impacts are accounted for and some of them aren't. Um, so, you know, the impact on people and the impact on the environment isn't currently adequately accounted for. So, you know, actually, the, 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 the issue is much broader. The cost and the, the impacts are much, much greater than just whether they are, you know, in today's terms, uh, financially viable, because that mm -hmm. that is changing. It, clearly, that is changing very rapidly um, in terms of expectations, in terms of internalization, in terms of, you know, rules and laws and other things like that that are picking these issues up and rightly so so you know i think it's actually a bit more nuanced and complex than is it cheap enough um we've got 70 years as someone else said uh, a couple of weeks ago we've got 70 or 100 years of optimization um you know to catch up on um with the rest of the sort of you know current fossil industry if you like so you know a hell of a lot of work to do um and that's kind of my starting point really is actually you know, what are we trying to achieve here rather than is it cheap yet? Um, because I think it's the wrong question. Yeah, that's really interesting. Okay, there's a number of really interesting questions coming through. Dan, there's one, well, there's about three for you here, so I'm going to merge them into one. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if you can see the chat, but there's specifically a question about the energy that follows from what we've just been talking about and, you know, the potential for something like a steam tracker to recover heat, energy, waste, that sort of thing. Is that part of the, the process? Yeah, so that's yeah, in terms of that's probably where we we will typically see our our units. So that's where sort of the what we where we see them ending up is is on you know these the chemical parks or chemical complexes near to steam crackers. Um, you know, particularly as they start to to uh, if we if we start to get scale them up um, and to become more of a sort of integrated um, petrochemical facility. That's definitely. Um, something that we 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 see yeah no that's interesting and that, that's another question that's come in the chat you know what what is the scale up plan obviously dan you you talked about building larger and larger plants or potentially multiple lines what about the rest of the panelists obviously some of you are at pilot scale some of you are at plant scale what is what's the, the scale up plan is it larger factories here in teesside is it mini plants all over the world how does it look I don't know if, if I want to go into this for you, but uh, in our sector, we're very much led by the legislation, unfortunately. Right. And uh, for the planning and permitting side of things, we have to be bound by, we've, we, we're led by a small waste incineration plant, even though it's not incineration. So that's something that's got to change massively. Um, and we can only go up to three tonnes an hour, which is the equivalent of 22,000 tonnes a year. And um, we've, we, it actually works for us because if we did it too small, we wouldn't get the contracts for the feedstock. Mm -hmm. If we did it too large, we, we wouldn't get enough feedstock in. So mm -hmm. it's a very fine balance between where you do it in our industry. But also we've found that, for example, we do a lot of work in earth moving tires. We, do, we don't have much competition or in fact, none in tracks. We're, we're the only company that deals with tracks. And we could literally take what we do here. And we know, for example, there's some mines in Wales that are desperate for us to take what we do and go and do it down there. Mm. And it's movable to Scotland, Wales, wherever you want it. Mm. Um, so that way of looking at it is we could take that to Namibia, we could take that to Australia or wherever. Yeah. We're not led by tyres, we could use different feedstocks. But there is definitely, for a commercial level, you do have to, for the planning and the permitting, there is a consideration because that could hold you back from being innovative as well. Mm. Um, for the time that it takes to get the permitting through, that will yeah. link the end of life status that you, that you need to achieve. No, that's a really important point. And again, it's coming back to that supply chain. It's coming back to that traceability. Yeah, I think that's really important for people to understand. 
you know, I think, yeah, there, there's a lot more to building a plant than having a good technology and, and the supply chain and the management of the supply chain. I know that probably everyone on the call has problems with supply chains. <laughs> They're either brilliant or there's rubbish in there and then it's very difficult and you have to do all sorts of clever or annoying things to get it into a good state to put into your process and adding pre-processing steps that cost you more money than you planned on doing. I totally understand. Uh, Andrew, there's one here for you that's a bit textile related. Uh, can you take PTFE? into your process as using Gore-Tex? Does it just get filtered out? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, inevitably, there will be some PTFE that goes into the process, not very yeah. much, um, because it's not incorporated in many of the sort of garments that would go through. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, it's an, it, it's an impurity um, that we would, we would filter out. Um, it would actually get filtered out of the, the cotton um, side of the process because it won't it won't dissolve with the mm. um with the solvents that we use for recovering the yeah. pt so it's left with the cotton when we dissolve the cotton then you know the pt would be left behind and be filtering it out at that point now whether there'd ever be enough there to be viable for then trying to do something with that waste stream mm. um I, I guess we would have to see i mean yeah. one of the key things with all of this is is, is scale. I mean, you know, harking back to the last question, I mean, we're working at the moment on the design of a thousand ton a year um, pilot uh, sort of demonstration scale plant um, in parallel with designing a 50,000 ton commercial scale plant. Obviously, that's what we want to build, but we're going to have to uh, do a demonstration scale plant first to persuade people uh, to put the money in to build, you know, one or more, hopefully more, you know, commercial scale plants. I think, you know, 50,000 is, is the sort of entry level and they'll get bigger from that if this technology takes off because there are millions and millions of tons of waste to get through. Even a 50,000 ton a year plant is, is, is peanuts really. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, this, uh, and the supply chains, I think, you know, supply chains are very flexible and basically stuff goes where the money is. So it's very hard to get started at small scale unless you're doing something quite specialized. Mm. Um, but, you know, once people can see that there is a real market, you know, then then people will, will you know, will adapt. People will adjust the supply chains to fit in with yeah. the commercial opportunity. Um, and, you know, we certainly get that feeling strongly from the supply chains we work with. Yeah. They're keen to do this. You know, and the sooner they can see that there's a real, you know, incentive that would allow them to invest in the equipment uh, to do this properly, then, you know, the sooner they'll do it. Yeah, that's brilliant. And actually, probably a really great note for us to end on. Actually, we've come to half past one. Uh, I will give the panelists an opportunity if there's any closing remarks they want to make in just a second. But I do just want to just you know end really on andrew's observation there which is you know it's not just about the upscale but you know we do need to see changes as laura was saying in in uh, the perception of these technologies and the supply chain and the life cycle analysis understanding as dan's highlighted um but we, we are going to see upscale even these large 50 kiloton plants are still small scale in, in terms of you know the scale of the problem there's a long journey to go on i also just want you to see the complementary nature of so many of these processes you know where um, in Warn Again, we can simply filter out PTFE. Uh, in other processes, you could, if you weren't careful, turn it into hydrofluoric, um, you know, depending on how you break it down. So understanding feedstocks, controlling feedstocks, working with suppliers, having circular business models is absolutely key to this industry working and you know, understanding it exactly like every business today is done, understanding that full holistic flow, not just the shiny process that happens on a chemical site somewhere, um, that includes the supply chain, that includes higher level waste hierarchy, management of these waste and reuse streams. It's just key to understanding this as, as a technology. So any closing remarks from the panel? Yeah, that's all right. Uh, a couple of brief ones. Uh, you do it there. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Just, just no, I'm going to say what I'm going to say. <laughs> Probably. Um, sorry, Laura. Um, thank you to CPI, I wanted to say, who've supported us and mm. are supporting us so i just there was a question about support why oh, yeah. why here because there's a huge amount of knowledge and skill um you know so important um and um ptfe particularly interested to pick that conversation up given the the material that we're focused on at the moment so happy to take that one offline uh, that's great 
No, yeah, absolutely. Laura, did you want to add anything else? Yeah, I just, um, it, it comes back to innovation. Somebody, there's a couple of brilliant comments in the uh, chat box there. Mm. First one's about funding. Yes, yeah. there's not enough. Um, mm. We don't tick the box. We're small, we're innovative, we're startups. Can we not stop the innovation by not providing the uh, money because you're a startup and it's a scary, mm. innovative process? We've got to do something about that. The second thing, as soon as anybody starts creating fuel or energy, we're not actually eligible for the EIS scheme. So people don't want to invest. Mm. That's got to change. Fair enough for the big businesses. But if you're a startup with an innovative process, we need to change that because it's it's stopping innovation because there's not enough inward investment. So, yeah, I'll be banging that drum if anybody wants to give me a hand. Brilliant. Okay. So... Maybe just one comment from me, which is, you know, I found it very interesting to hear about all of these different technologies. And I think in many ways they're complementary. Mm. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, what we have to bear in mind when we're looking at the circular economy is there is no silver bullet. Mm. You know, um, it's going to be a mixture of, of different approaches, different technologies. You know, if something can be reused, reuse it. If it can be simply mechanically recycled, do that. You know, if you can use, you know, uh, a chemical reprocessing technology like ours, which is not depolymerizing things, that's good. But some things you are going to have to depolymerize. You're going to have to, you know, take a different approach. But these things are all complementary. And what we need to do is, is, is develop, you know, an infrastructure in this country that's able to, uh, to cope with a wide range of different waste streams with with a, a web of different ways of closing that circle, not just trying to think of, you know, one easy way to do it all. And that's, there's a bit of a tendency in government to say, well, just give us the easy answer. Mm. Well, there isn't one, I'm afraid, you know, but it's going to be down to a lot of companies with a lot of innovation working together to create that sort of cascade of, of different loops to close the big loop overall. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's brilliant. Anybody else want to say anything? Well, I think everyone's done. So with that, I'll just uh, thank the panel. Thanks very much uh, for joining us. I'll hand you back to Sue to close the event, but uh, I'll see sincere thanks to the panel. Thanks for being so open and uh, honest about the opportunities and the challenges of your processes and, and giving us that holistic overview and, and helping everybody uh, understand the, the significant opportunity it has for, for us as a region, but nationally and internationally as well. So. Thanks for the work that you're doing. Thanks for participating today. Sue, back to you. Thank you, David, and thank you for chairing it so well. Uh, that's been marvellous. Um, if anybody would like to be added to the CIE mailing list, please get in touch with me. This event has been recorded and will be going on our YouTube channel. I usually distribute the link through our newsletter. So if you'd like that, please get in touch with me. Uh, I'll just share the slide for the next event again, uh, and I'll leave that up while uh, people sort of log off so that you can uh, have a look at it and make a note of the date, if you like. Uh, is that showing now? That's great. Thanks very much, Sue. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody.